you well know, there's a strong native sentiment that favors freedom in New Hampshire. That's ordinary, it's normal, and you don't hear about it. It's not like real high profile, you don't hear about it a lot. In Keene in particular, it's very noisy uh, on the part of the people who, who are pro status. So my question is, um, some of those people, my observation is some of those people uh, have not ideological disputes, but, but stylistic or methodological disputes with uh, Robin Hooding. And in fact, some have, have told me, I feed meters. So like they're pre-Robin Hooders. Before any of us ever lived in New Hampshire, they were going around feeding meters. So this is not controversial. These people are uh, happy with feeding meters, and they're very freedom friendly. So they're potentially allies, but they have some other objections. Um, stylistically, and I don't know, sometimes it's the video cameras, sometimes it's who knows what all, but do you have any sense for what can be done? Um, I mean, I do certain things that, that I think you guys are probably not, largely not, not aware of, but what can be done publicly or in terms of perception and reach out to those people who are ideological allies but turned off for some other reason? We've come up uh, against this objection forever. And uh, I want, uh, hopefully, everyone on this panel to, to address this question. Um, of the people out there who will say, and to sum up that s sentiment, it's usually said, well, I agree with a lot of what you guys stand for, but I don't agree with your methods. And of course, the question that should be asked, I think, in that case is, well, well what do you mean? What, what is it that you don't agree with? Can you be more specific? And you know everybody's got their thing, right? So for everybody, it's something. So it's, well, I don't like it when you record people in public, or I don't like it because you uh, follow and, and, and harass these uh, meter maids, or I don't like it because you know, they just come up with something. I don't like uh, you smoking pot in public, or toplessness. Women should not be topless. You know, so they these are people who might be with us on 60 percent, 70 percent, 50 percent of the of the issues. They feel that uh, that they that they understand where we're coming from maybe on certain things, but then we're doing things, and inevitably when you do something, there, it's going to polarize, and that kind of comes back to something we were talking about earlier with Robin Hooding, seemingly to be this like, unassailable thing, you're helping people, but yet there's all these people that, you know, and again, a small percentage, I think, but very vocal, who speak against it. What do you say, how do you address this issue of, well, I, I like a lot of what you say, but I don't like your methods, how do you handle that? <clears throat> well, I want to empathize with anyone who's you know, reaching out to have a discussion about you know, improving tactics. And, uh, however, I have to be true to myself, and that's ultimately where I'm going to come from when I'm uh, having that discussion and, and showing that empathy. It's like, I, I hear you that you feel this way, and this is why I feel this way. and just being peaceful and explaining why I do what I do and being true to yourself. I think people can recognize that even if they strongly disagree with what you do, if they see that you're being genuine and that you feel like you're doing a good, right thing, I think that most people can respect that. Yeah, being a local, I hear a lot of these criticisms from people I grew up with, like, oh, you guys have some of the right ideas, not all the right ideas, but some of them, and you just cross too many lines, and I mean, I, I think the lines that are crossed in Keene and in New Hampshire as a whole, but it's pretty realistic, mostly Keene. Um, I, I think those lines that are crossed are completely necessary. I mean, like, this is pushing boundaries that just don't happen elsewhere. Um, and, and I mean, like, um, one, one thing I heard once while I was Robin Hooding was, uh, oh, you know, I used to be able to bring my kids downtown before you people, but, you know, you guys walk around topless, smoking pot with guns. It's like, that happened three years ago before I lived in Keene. Um, so I don't really know where I was going with that, actually. But, um. <laughs> I mean, I would say that, you know, um, I, I definitely want to hear people's opinion and, and criticism and critique of anything that or any of us are doing. And uh, if people feel the need to come and talk to me, I try to uh, have a discussion with them. Uh, Dr. Dave in particular, just as an example, I, I sent him an email and I said, you know, I'd like to talk with you on the record and, you know, I'd like to hear your concerns and then, uh, you know, maybe I can try to address some of them. And initially he agreed to that and then he, he backed out later on 
he said he's not interested in, you know, in pursuing that, and I was kind of disappointed in that. But a lot of people they don't they don't want to actually have a conversation about the methodology that you're using. They just want to say, well, I heard such and such, like my example earlier. I heard you guys stand in front of ambulances, or I heard you know you run around naked or whatever. <laughs> you know they they heard. There's a lot of rumors in a small town like Keene. And it's hard to, if, if you live your life trying to please everyone, to me that's a fool's errand. There is no possible way that, that, that you're going to do that. And like I said, if someone has a, a concern, like they really want to talk to me, okay, let's talk. And, if, and if, you're, if your points are that valid and convincing, perhaps I will change my tactics. Like, um, if I'm really doing something that upsets you, let me know about it. There's no way I can change my behavior unless you let me know. So I'm very open to criticism. I want people to offer their perspective and concerns. And, you know, I guess I'll just leave it at that. I try and go the extra mile in, in making people more comfortable and may take issue with the activity. Like when we had protesters in the square, um, we made some cupcakes and brought them down for them. And not that many people were interested, but uh, I think just going, when, when someone's, uh, you know, bringing an idea of like opposition to you, I think, you know, meeting that, uh, meeting their ideas, but then also, you know, trying to do some show of reconciliation with them is a great step. Um, one thing I think could be said about, I guess every activist community, it's not specific to New Hampshire, is that uh, when, when somebody involves himself in activity, engages in an activity, it, it's going to come to consume the identity of that person in other people's minds. So uh, people may see me and associate me with Robin Hooding or James with Robin Hooding or some of the other projects we've been involved with. Um, and for that reason, I think it's good to have a diversity of activities that one's engaged in, and they don't all need to necessarily be political. Um, sometimes when I'm out Robin Hooding, I'll have the shovel, uh, snow shovel in my car, and if I can't find the parking enforcer, I'll shovel out the parking lot so people can walk in between the spaces without having snow up to their knees. Uh, these are just little things that I think really you know, and it doesn't need to be publicized that much. It's just one of those things like people see the Robin Hooders picking up trash or shoveling snow. Uh, they're going to appreciate that. And I think it's something that's uh, incumbent on all activists to, to go the extra mile and try and be uh, more of what you'd like to see emulated in the community. Even if you can't dedicate all of your time to one activity or another, um, people will, will pick up on those things and perhaps they'll emulate some of those things. I'd like to add real quick, a lot of folks too, they will say like, you know, that what Ian was saying, I, you know, I like what you guys are doing, I don't like your methods. And, and some people will say, well, why don't you do X, Y, Z? Like, why don't you focus on welfare corruption or whatever their pet peeve is? And my general response is, you know, okay, I, I agree that's an important issue, why don't you do it and show me how to do it? Like, it's one thing to, to just tell someone how to do something, but it's, it's like learning. You can, I could tell all of you guys, like, okay, um, here's how you do something, and, you know, I'm an Excel guy. Here's how I do it in Excel, but, you know, I should tell you, I should show you, and then, and then you guys do it, and so, you, so I know you learned, right? But, you know, I'm always open to learning. I, I'm, like, like Pete Ayer says, uh, in court, they, they ask him, like, what's your highest level of education? And, I don't remember how old he is, but he said like, oh, uh, 35 years, you know. I, I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I want to um, just hold the question for just a moment, I, I want, because we've kind of come on to a, to a topic that I think is really important, I just want to th throw this out there, um, about being peaceful. I wanted to come back around to this, you know, because <clears throat> the critics and the quiet, the quiet critics, uh, you know, saying, well, I, I like a lot of what you say, but I don't like your tactics. Well, first of all, okay. What do you mean by that? Does that mean I'm only supposed to do politics? Because people don't like that either. You know, as we found out with the school board meeting, we brought a dozen people in there, proposed uh, lower budgets, and you know, we were voted down, obviously, but there, we were spoken against, we were laughed at, we were told by the, the people in this, uh, this room, especially one attorney who's like, you know, Mr. Parliamentarian who gets up there and basically plays for the state. Uh, this attorney essentially called us, you know, these people, and really just very looking down one's nose at us. Um, there's not much you can do to satisfy everybody, and I think that point was, was made very, very well. So even if all you do is politics, as soon as you become successful there, the hate, people will hate you for that. Uh, so anytime 
you do something that makes an impact. And, and usually politics, you don't make an impact immediately. So you won't get that initial, you know, it won't be like going out topless on the square where there's going to be an initial reaction to, to that from people in the community. When you're in the political scene, you're writing letters to politicians, you're speaking at uh, you know, city council hearings, you're speaking at, at the state house. It doesn't have a, a real, it doesn't make a splash. People aren't going to be as opinionated because they're never going to hear about it for the most part. But when you do something that people hear about, it makes the news. That's when people have opinions. And when you're upsetting their, their viewpoint of the world, they're more likely to bristle against it. Uh, if it's something that challenges their long-held beliefs, they're likely to bristle against it. So we, we really can't make people happy. But I think one of the most important things we can do consistently, I agree, James, we should listen to critique. I've yep. seen, I've seen uh, you know, keen activism change over the years. I've been there for a long time. And I've seen it uh, shift. I think like the school outreach, for instance, there was a real pushback against that from some people in the community. And so we changed our tactics. Rather than talking about school sucks, let's talk about how great education is, but maybe government school, not so great. So kind of change the perspective. Be more effective with what it is that you're doing. The other thing that you can do consistently, regardless of what other people think and say, is you can remain peaceful, especially in the face of people who are threatening to you, especially in the face of people who are critical, getting up in your face. There have been a lot of situations uh, that people have been involved in, and I think everyone at this table has, has experienced this, because we're all out on the streets, we're all doing things. A lot of situations where people have threatened us or you know, attempted to escalate a situation, and we've successfully de-escalated those situations. So I'd like, uh, and Derek, I'm going to think of one here, but if you want to add an additional one that you can recall on how you handle that, how you stay calm. Um, one of them was this camera. Uh, you had a camera taken from you by a man on the street who, ironically enough, turns out to be a professional videographer, the man who stole Derek J's camera. He works with Ken Burns, apparently, this you know, documentary filmmaker. And uh, you were just out doing a report on Robin Hooding at the time, and this guy gets out of his minivan, he comes up, he takes your camera from you. Now, you read the comments on YouTube about this, which I don't generally recommend, but you'll see people <laughs> saying things like, Man, Derek, if I were you, I'd have shot that guy. And how would that have made things go? <laughs> but how did you handle that? Yeah, uh, instead, I froze. I was pretty surprised. I'm not accustomed to people just taking things out of my hands. And uh, he was accusing me of being a Robin Hooder, which I wasn't. I was filming the Robin Hooders. You know, I'd only been in town for like a day I was visiting, so it was really strange. And I froze and just stared and let him yell at me while he was holding my camera. So this is great because you know I'm filming him at first. He comes up, grabs it, but now I guess with his videographer instincts, which I wasn't aware of, he's filming me, and I'm standing there like, you know, doe-eyed. And uh, instead, the the driver who was at the car, who was uh, being had the meter fed. Um, he, comes out and is like, well, wait, 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 What's, that's my car, it's okay, you know, that's, that's all right, whatever was happening, it's fine. You know, it's just like trying to de-escalate this third person who didn't really see what was going on, didn't really know that the camera had been stolen or anything, was just like, he saw something was wrong, because um, there was one guy yelling, <laughs> me just very confused, and uh, I, I think if you'll watch the video, it happens pretty quickly, but he ends up being like, all right, I became the aggressor here. He doesn't say those words, but then he turns around and gives the camera back after having like threatened me and um, apologizes and, and goes on his way. And I thought that was a huge, huge win because um, it could have easily escalated. I know a lot of people's first reaction, especially in, in the comment section of YouTube was like, why don't you pop that guy, you know, like, I, like I can pop anyone. <laughs> um, but that was what a lot of people's reaction I think would be, and I think it's a good general rule to keep the five second rule of like before you speak or before you act in, in a really strong way, maybe take a breath and think about what you're going to do for five seconds. No one's going to blame you for just like taking a breath and thinking for a little while. And on camera, it actually worked out pretty nice. <laughs> so that's, that's one situation. You've had, you've had a run in. Yeah, I've actually I've had several situations like that. I mean, 
like was talked about earlier, the uh, Dr. Dave Berman incident, and that was more humorous than anything. For anyone that's seen the video, me and Gary obviously handled the situation pretty peacefully. Um, and then recently, there was a guy contracted through the city of Keene working for uh, Emerson's Towing and Repairs. And so I'm standing about 30 feet away as he shows up to tow. And I, I don't even know why I was filming, honestly. I usually don't film, which I should, but I, I decided that day I'm going to film this car being towed. Yeah, that's and, a good thing to film. Yes, yeah. definitely. Um, and the dude gets out of his vehicle, and the first thing he says is, get that camera out of my face or I'll knock your teeth out. And this is from about 30 feet away. So, you know, obviously, if someone's telling me they're going to knock my teeth out, chances are I'm going to keep filming. Situation only got uglier from there, but they, I handled it relatively peacefully. I mean, I, I personally think I could have handled it better, honestly. I've been told by a lot of people, like, oh, you handled it fine. Like, you know, the guy was screaming at you. He told you he'd knock your teeth out. He told you next time you have to... He told me in front of a cop, because the cops eventually got called by someone else. Um, he told me, uh, I don't have a gun, next time I will. Yeah, I, I could have handled it better, but realistically, yes, I handled it peacefully because that's really the only way you can handle situations like that without escalating it to violence, and I, I don't want to deal with that. Uh, you know, this is something that um, I, I've struggled with. Um, you know, on one hand, I, I want to defend myself, but like a, a guy um, named Nick, there's a video where he... He, he, he punches me, he takes a swing at me. And, you know, I made a very conscious decision, like, you know, if this guy's gonna hit me, you know, go ahead. And, and I made the decision, like, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do anything. Perhaps if he, and, and I didn't file charges, and perhaps I should have, but one of the things, like, if he had injured me or my property, I probably would have been more upset. You know, I, I forgive the guy. I mean, he, he was upset and he punched me. And, and it is very hard to remain peaceful. It's hard when someone is, is really angry at you and, and yelling. And I, I think that it, like what really motivates me, you know, I've changed a lot over the years. A couple years ago, I would have decked the guy. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind. And I think being around people who are peaceful has definitely shifted my perspective to, you know, peace is the way, and that's how I want to live my life. I don't want... Uh, you know, I don't want to get violent unless it's absolutely necessary. And, uh, you know, perhaps if, you know, if someone was trying to kill me, I probably would defend myself. But, I mean, like if someone is just, is just talking to you, even if it's in a very angry tone and cussing you out and they're very upset with you, I mean, the reality is that's not going to hurt you. It's not going to hurt you if they're filming you. It's not, you know, at, at the end of the day, you're going to be fine. And I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, until it actually gets physical, and even then, if you can, it's better to, I would argue, to run away, to keep the moral high ground, than to initiate force, even, even self-defensive force, because the moment you do that, people are going to be like, well, I thought you were peaceful. And if the message you want to present to the world is, I I'm a peaceful guy, and that's the message that I want, you know, I want to live in a peaceful world, it's like Gandhi said, you have to be the change you want to see in the world. And, and if someone is going to, like let's say someone came up and, and shot me or something, you know, they're so upset with me that they're going to do that. I mean, uh, I guess that's just the, the, you know, my, my fate, if you will. Obviously, like when I cross the street, I'm going to look both ways. I don't want to go down, but I, I'm not going to live my life in fear of what other people are going to do to me. And to me, that's like they're winning. If, if someone is threatening you, they're bullying you, and they're saying, I'm going to use force against you, which, you know, like the state, and you say, oh, okay, I guess I'll, I'll give in. At the end of the day, it's like you're, you're giving them what they want. And I, I don't want to do that. I want to say, you know, no, what you're doing is wrong, and, well, I'm not going to necessarily take a, some kind of violent action to stop you. I'm definitely going to try to point that out. I think it's great that, that Graham filmed the interaction with the tow driver. And if the, even if the gentleman, let's say he'd gotten out of the car, I had been there, and he said, hey, I don't want you to film me, I would have told him my reason, like, well, you're, you're working for the city right now. You're about to take this person's car, and well, I don't want to film you, I want to, I want to film that. I want to show people the consequences of what happens if you get a ticket and you don't pay for it. So, you know, I, I probably would try to, like, de-escalate, explain my motivation, 
<clears throat> I, I think that goes a long way. Some people you can't reason with. There's Gary and I have been attacked like outside of the queues. They're, they're drunk or whatever, you know. And the guy like latched on to Garrett, and at that point I did intervene. And I like pushed him away, but I mean, some people you, you can't really reason with, and I don't know. I guess my my point is. I don't want to say no matter what, but pretty much no matter what, you have to remain peaceful. The second you, you, you lose legitimacy if you, if you fly off the hinges. And one of the things that, like um, in the civil rights movement, there, there's some great like, training documents you can read where, uh, like they, they have these training sessions for people doing sit-ins or whatever other actions they were doing where potentially people would attack them, whether <coughs> individuals or uh, people working for the state, and there there are some really great things to read, and people would be like screaming at. They, they would train for these kind of things, and they, they they were pretty smart too. They would like dress up, and they would try to maybe they're even smarter than us in that regard, but uh, they would try to maintain that public image. That's so important. You want to add anything? Yeah, sure. This is one of those situations where the more experience you have with it, like police encounters, the more police encounters you have, you'll become less nervous, more comfortable, uh, more aware of what you need to do next time. And I'd say the same is true when somebody is trying to pick a fight with you and somebody wants to engage in violence. Um, the more experience you have with that, and unfortunately I've got a lot of experience with that, um, the, I'd say the more calm you get, the more reasonable you can be. Um, it's hard not to get angry when somebody's angry with you and wanting to attack you, but as when you, I, I guess uh, I bring to the table a certain confidence that I know I can evade just about anyone on foot. And <laughs> I, um, I also know that uh, coming from like a criminal justice or police accountability background, the criminal justice system, as many of us know as libertarians and anarchists, doesn't really provide justice. At the very best, the most it can do is just remove violent people from society. That's really the only thing that it could practically accomplish. Um, but at the same time, uh, what you can do with a camera and documenting someone's bad activity, I think goes above and beyond anything that can be done if nobody documents it and you just tell the story of what this person did that was so bad. So uh, the camera is a wonderful criminal justice tool. I feel like any time when Robin Hooding has gotten to a point, or when I've been out Robin Hooding, and someone has tried to engage me with either threats or actual acts of violence, that, uh, of course, it detracts from the activism. It, Robin Hooding stops at that point, and it becomes about ensuring my safety, ensuring the safety of others, and keeping the camera and the lens focused on them, even if that angers them. And if it does, they need to learn that if the more angry they get, the more lenses are gonna be pointed at them. Fortunately, in the situation with uh, that Nick guy that punched James, there was uh, three of us who had cameras, and we were tri we were triangulating around him. And the reason we began filming is because he began making threats. So uh, I see that that that's not, of course, Robin Hooding. That's a, a public safety activism. But um, of course, that's anything that any of us could do. If you see someone engaging in threats of violence or acts of violence, document it 100%. Um, that's the the best thing you can do, and expose their behavior. And that will anger them. Um, I got video of a rather large man named Travis Hobbs trying to attack myself. When he failed to attack myself, he then turned his rage on Graham. Um, now I, I had some serious contemplating to do as to whether or not to file criminal charges against this person. And uh, the straw that broke the camel's back in deciding to put my principles aside and let the state go after uh, one of their biggest supporters was that uh, he continued to make threats of violence. Um, free speech is great. Uh, Robin Hooding, I guess, is a free speech activity. I didn't realize that until we got sued and won on free speech grounds, I guess. <laughs> but uh, many of these, I mean, I guess maybe, not to stereotype, but there's like a little bit of a backwoods element in Keene because it is kind of isolated. And I get the impression that some of these, uh, I'll use a derogatory term like rednecks, um, some of these people believe that, oh, well, I can threaten you, that's free speech. In fact, the man who threatened Graham said, it's, this isn't criminal threatening, that's when I threaten to kill you, not kick your ass. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing that's been, uh, I found a little bit disappointing about Keen is that when the video like such with Graham, uh, when somebody's making such extreme threats, I mean the city officials, they know the PR stuff, the, the city manager, he backed away from that and he said that uh, that tow company is off the city's towing list for a while. 
Uh, but like the community itself, I thought it was a, a rather uh, poor and shameful reaction on some of the parts of the haters to be defending this man's actions, defending threats of violence. Um, so I think that's something that obviously I, I wouldn't say capitalize on, but um, you need to, that needs to be documented. People need to. Uh, it's a conversation that we need to continue to have. It's unfortunate that Robin Hooding has come to kind of intersect with criminal justice activism at all, but. Um, when it goes in that direction, I think that's when uh, it's, all, it's an accountability project, but if anything needs more accountability than the parking structure, it's the criminal justice system. So uh, more videography in court or of those proceedings would be great. I don't think it's necessarily an indictment of Keene as a location that people would, would be in support of someone you know, committing violence against a Robin Hooder. I think that if this were happening to the extent that it is in Keene anywhere else, you would see a violent pushback. You would see people supporting that violence. I mean, people, uh, you know, they went to watch executions, you know, back in the day. So there's certainly a, a, a contingent of people out there who have a certain bloodlust, and they uh, love the idea that we might get hurt and that we might, you know, possibly get killed, etc. I know there were at least a couple questions over here. Who hasn't asked a question yet? Who uh, would like to? Okay. <laughs> So talking about cameras and public cameras versus private cameras, uh, I have, well, a couple things. Uh, in New Mexico, they used to have some red light cameras, and uh, we heard from one of the people high up in the police department that uh, the public reason was for public safety was less people run red lights, we have uh, more safety. But what was actually happening was it was a revenue generator. And uh, it created more accidents as, as uh, people would approach an intersection, they'd slam on their brakes and you'd end up with a lot of accidents, but they were generating revenue and eventually they were removed. Uh, but those public cameras, already in our town in Albuquerque, there's uh, cameras on every uh, stoplight aimed at the intersections. And I had a, a, a small car accident and the lady gave me some false info. I eventually figured it all out and had my first court experience working through that. So it was a good, I, I saw it as an opportunity to work through the court system. But I was thinking about those public cameras and what if I couldn't have figured out who she was and where she was? Could I have gotten a copy of the, the video footage from the city? I mean, it's publicly funded. And I know in like universities, when you uh, publicly fund a research project, that the results of that become public and people can use it. So if we're publicly funding all of these cameras that the, the state uses, I, I think the, the data should be public. I'm just going to throw a quick answer out for that one. Uh, in New Hampshire, we have the 91A process, and there's a group of activists in Keene that have been meeting over the last uh, few years, not a few years, a few months, uh, to, uh, to talk about 91A and, for, and create 91A requests. So you send this uh, sheet into whatever government agency that you want information from, like video footage, for instance, and they're supposed to respond with that. There are certain excuses they can use in certain circumstances to tell you they are not going to give you the information, but something like that. Uh, as James mentioned, with the Robin Hooding situation, they had that cop come out and film 40 hours worth of footage. We have all that footage, and that footage was uploaded to the, was it Freeman TV Raw? The Freeman TV Raw channel on YouTube. So yeah, in New Hampshire, most of that stuff is, uh, is absolutely available. Questions that, uh, from folks who have not asked them. I don't actually have a question. I just really want to thank you guys, because I think what you're doing is really important. I think I've learned so much since before I moved to New Hampshire and since I moved to New Hampshire. 